On today's episode, weapons of opportunity. What are they and how to use them? Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Survival Dispatch News. Today we're talking about improvised weapons, or I should say weapons of opportunity. But before we get into that, Sal, what is our conflicted question of the day? Well, this is a tough one today, Denny. Uh, here's the question. A deadly flu outbreak has infected one third of your group and you don't have the means to quarantine them or the medicine to help them. Do you vote with the rest of your group to banish them from your group or do you take it upon yourself to eliminate the infected ones before it spreads any further? Oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's the question <laughs> for everybody to ponder. Okay, all right. So guys, uh, everybody at home be thinking about that. Sal and I are gonna give our answers at the end of today's discussion. So when I was kicking off the discussion, I said improvised weapons, but really, we're calling it weapons of opportunity, but what's the difference between the two, Sal? Well, the difference would be a weapon of opportunity is just an object in your environment that you can grab as a force multiplier. It is what it is when you pick it up. An improvised weapon would be something that takes some pre-planning and some configuration to turn those common objects into a weapon. Yeah, cool. I love that term, weapon of opportunity. So why do we need to know about weapons of opportunity? Well, we go into a lot of environments where we have to be disarmed, unfortunately. We all know that if we travel and you're in airports, et cetera, you're you're disarmed. If you have to go into a courthouse or a federal building, you're disarmed. However, in most environments, there are indeed weapons of opportunity just about everywhere. So you should be familiar with what those objects are and what you can do with those different objects. Uh, for sure. There are a ton of innovative products now in the self-defense industry that are being sold as, I guess, improvised weapons or weapons that are pre uh, objects that are pre-planned to be used as weapons. We're really not talking about those today. Let's jump right into weapons of opportunity. You've actually broken this down into some categories. Uh, tell me about, tell us about your, your different categories. So when I think of this, I think of actual weapons of opportunity opportunity that are in the environment. So those are going to be objects that are just readily available, again, in most places that you go. If you think of airports and all of these different public locations, there are certain objects that are going to be readily available that you can utilize. Uh, beyond that, think of edged weapons of opportunity a common steak knife when you're at a restaurant, um, other sharp objects that might be around fire axes, etc. And then the final category in terms of the way I think about it are actual pre-planned and actually uh, objects that you can carry that really don't fit the definition of weapons. So they're going to be able to go almost anywhere. But now those would be more of uh, prefabricated, uh, improvised weapons, if you will, more so than just of opportunity since they're objects you're actually carrying with you. You brought in up some very interesting scenarios, courthouses, airports. Uh, man, I, you and I travel a lot. You, you have uh, actually experienced some things in some of those different areas where you weren't able to uh, carry weapons. What's the first thing on your mind when you see a potential threat as far as weapons are concerned? And what's your, like, what's your go-to weapon of opportunity and why? So if you're totally unarmed, which is probably going to be the focus of this discussion, right? It, it changes the dynamic for us in our own capacity to fight back. But the other thing should still be in play. For example, our awareness to what is going on, right? It's even that much more important when we're armed. It's, it's extremely important whether we're armed or not. Okay, let's understand that. We want to be able to avoid what we can avoid. But when you're unarmed, it's yet that much more important. So when you see trouble coming, you want to be able to get out of the vicinity as quickly as possible. If you find yourself just stuck somewhere, things that immediately come to mind are things that are common in the environment. For example, the chair. Consider the chair or bar stools. Almost everywhere you go, there's different uh, restaurants and environments where people sit down to eat, etc. Those things can be used as a great shield. They can be used as an impact weapon, and they can even be used as an object that you can throw so yeah. if, if you're facing the probably more likely scenario of somebody who maybe goes berserk and is unarmed themselves a chair you can use as a great defensive shield and a great impact weapon if you face the worst case scenario like an active shooter or somebody armed with a firearm 
in an environment where you're totally disarmed, then you could look at a chair or stool, again, is very effective to throw. And it's kind of outside of the scope of the discussion here. But when you throw a large ob object at somebody, they flinch. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize how many actions active shooters have actually been stopped that way throwing large objects then rushing the individual really oh yeah there's been numerous stops made that way especially if you get several people in the environment motivated yeah. to do it you throw large objects they cannot help the natural human tendency to to flinch it's a given reaction when something large flies towards you and you're buying yourself a couple seconds uh and the damage that it can cause if you throw something sufficiently heavy and hit somebody it can be it yeah. can be very effective so active shooters have been stopped that way so consider those things when you sit down in an environment what's around me what could i grab the other thing i really like the chair for and i've actually done experimenting with this in in training is if you're dealing with somebody with an edged weapon mm -hmm. chair is a great force multiplier it it is a shield that if you use it well makes it almost impossible for that person to get past that that yeah. shield barrier with the edged weapon so consider that and uh, again yep. internationally edged weapon attacks are a lot more common than they are here any environment that you're in a bar stool works great for this or a chair especially like a bar chair that's taller with longer legs it's a very yep. formidable uh barrier that you can utilize for defense i get the old lion tamer image in my mind where he's got the yeah. stool and he's holding the lion at bay and well, he's cracking his whip or whatever, but really that's, uh, it can be used to hold an attacker at bay, uh, uh, say somebody who's, who doesn't, who doesn't have a gun, obviously uh, a solid object is going to, going to protect you so much if bullets are coming flying at you, but someone who's unarmed or somebody with a knife that's coming at you, trying to stab you to, to use that object to, to keep them at bay and using it as a, as a weapon as well. So at the beginning of this conversation, we started talking, I have this image in my mind about Basically anything that's not anchored down yes, that I can yeah. pick up that I'm strong enough to to use to defend myself and also attack the attacker with. So I'm thinking I'm I'm looking around this room I'm in right now, looking at dozens of things. There's a lamp. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a even a a, co a coaster that you put a drink on that's got an edge on. I'm thinking about anything yeah. I can use going through that scenario in my mind right now. Am I on the right track? Oh, absolutely. A heavy drinking glass, a heavy vase that's sitting at your table, anything like that. Uh, consider also really large objects. Now, we're we're big proponents of building some fitness and some strength, right? Especially yep. in a bad situation where you get the adrenaline dump, you're going to have a brief period of superhuman strength. If the table is not truly anchored down, can you rip that thing off the ground and throw it? Can you rip it off the ground and throw it to a, through a plate glass window to facilitate your own escape? Yeah. consider those things so you can use objects against the aggressor you can use objects to do things you obviously otherwise would not do to facilitate your own escape so there's a lot available in the environment heavy objects are always available for use um, another object while we're on the weapons of opportunity discussion is certainly one I think we've mentioned elsewhere, and that is the fire extinguisher. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you we know, definitely the, had yeah. that, discussed that before. And, and really, the fire extinguisher does two things for you. First of all, it's very big and heavy. Typically, any public place, they have... They have the large ones, the big industrial ones, not the tiny little ones like we typically keep in a kitchen, right? Yeah. So I recommend to people have a couple of the big ones for your home too. But in any public place, if you can get your hands on the fire extinguisher, it's usually large. It's very heavy. So you can hit with it really hard. But you want to be able to hit somebody in the head with that thing when they round a corner or whatever the case may be. And the fire extinguisher also gives the advantage of which mm -hmm. if you hit somebody with that spray, it's it's very disorienting the the big fire extinguishers they put out a huge volume of the spray you're going to close the eyes of whoever you hit again active shooters have been disrupted and stopped with fire extinguishers and that's kind of a go-to tactic that's taught to people who work in environments where they just can't be armed with anything else if you can get your hands on the fire extinguisher that can be a real game changer especially if you have to deal with somebody who has a projectile weapon so if you're outside of your environment obviously you have to look around and see what's around you and have that frame of mind what can i use if something goes down 
So if I'm not in my own house, I know where my fire extinguishers are. I know where my, my steak knives are. I know where my stuff is. Obviously, I know where my, my uh, firearms are. Usually I have one on my person anyway, but we're talking about when you don't. So that situational awareness really comes into play in all these scenarios, right? Absolutely. Know what's around you. And, and especially if you are unarmed, that, that's when this becomes really important. If you're carrying weaponry, right, that's going to be your go-to, what you're wearing. But when you're unarmed, part of your situational awareness should certainly be what is available to me right now. You mentioned steak knives. If you're sitting having dinner when things go bad and you're unarmed and you have a steak knife in front of you, that's a lot better than a handful of nothing. So yeah. there, there is a lot of objects typically that you can press into action for this. And in my mind, I'm thinking training training, training, if we're going to use a blunt object or if we're going to use an edged edged weapon, oh, this is commonly what people think about when using edge weapons. But when we take edge weapon training, we're obviously we're often taught to hold the weapons differently, uh, not necessarily protruding from the bottom of your hand, top of your hand, just for for instance, and the different techniques, different uh, striking slashing techniques. So really, training does come into play. You can actually use that training with weapons of opportunity or improvised weapons as well in my mind anyway. And I think you probably would agree with me on Absolutely. that. Uh, tools. I love my tools. I've got a whole garage full of tools. I've got a junk drawer full of tools. I've got hammers. I've got screw screwdrivers. Uh, and all these can make excellent weapons. No question. So when, when it comes to, I think tools are especially appropriate if you're somewhere where you're unarmed and you're actually staying somewhere right like maybe internationally or even domestically where you're unarmed these are the kind of things that you can put in your place of residence because when you're in public tools may not be readily accessible but mm -hmm. let's say you're staying at a hotel or airbnb somewhere a good claw hammer if i could think of one tool that if I'm unarmed, what is one tool that's an actual tool that I would want in my hands? It's it's a good it's a good framing hammer. It, it, yep. it is and if you had a use impact weapons for fighting, a framing hammer is incredibly devastating. So uh, a framing hammer would be my go to for if I'm somewhere totally unarmed. And I would take that weapons and I've done training with both the, the downside to edged weapons is even though they're very lethal it takes time to stop somebody with yeah. an edged weapon, right? Because they they stop by bleeding to death, essentially. They stop by mm -hmm. depressurizing. So mm -hmm. even if you cut major arteries, there's still a time element. Whereas against human beings, impact is immediate. An impact with a framing hammer to the head, I don't care how big and strong the guy is, it is an immediate event. Yeah. So, so impact tools are absolutely immediate. That's why something like a claw hammer that's also what i recommend to people who work places where they're absolutely disarmed let's say you yeah. teach if i taught in public school and i can't be armed with anything else i would have a claw hammer sitting in my desk and i would say well i use that you know, for whatever hanging things on the wall and whatever i have to fix in the classroom because that's that's what i would have available because if worse came to worse and you do a lockdown drill i'm ready for anything that comes through that doorway i'm going to be on the outside of the frame of that door and and whatever comes through the door is going to meet something they're not expecting. So claw hammer yeah. is a tremendous weapon. Uh, there's there's uh, classes that teach how to use impact tools, and they're they're harder to find than firearms training or something like that. But but you can find it. It's usually combatives guys, hand to hand guys will teach some of that stuff, and it's worth yeah. taking that kind of training if you can find it. The old method of we, who carries a, a whole coin roll full of full of pennies anymore. But I think where I'm going with this, the, the whole fact that if you can carry something in your fist, if you if you have to strike with your fist, helps to keep your fist from collapsing, helps to keep most of that energy and momentum going towards your target. And even grasping something in your hand uh, that you can also use as an impact weapon will also uh, possibly help you if you have to go to some form of hand-to-hand -hand, uh, combat as well. And speaking of fists, what about improvised things that can be used as a form of a brass knuckle. Does anything yeah. come to mind when, when we bring that up? Absolutely. What I like for that is a large carbiner. Okay. Because that can go anywhere. Yeah. Obviously, brass knuckles cannot. Brass knuckles, unfortunately, are, are prohibited pretty much in all 
in in the majority of states again we come back to how stupid these laws are right because yeah. in most states you can with a permit or over half the states require no carry permit you can carry your glock 17 with three reloads but if you carry brass knuckles man that's a felony <laughs> so it's it's totally ridiculous but a, a carbiner is perfectly legitimate tool especially when you're traveling right you carry a carbiner to hook your water bottle to your backpack or whatever and if you yeah. get a larger one that is basically like a set of brass knuckles when you when you put your fingers through it so carbiner is a great solution for that and now we're talking about improvised weapons right so yeah. these are going free, to be things free plan you got things it. you got it free plan things maybe things that we kind of fabricate to be in a certain configuration so these are not just weapons of opportunity in the environment this is something you're going to carry on you but it's an everyday item so it's pretty much legal everywhere but you can turn it into a pretty formidable striking weapon you mentioned you know, the roll of quarters to use as a fist load or you can drop that in a sock and have a blackjack now one of my favorite options for a blackjack is a heavy padlock with a handkerchief or something else that you can use to just run through that lock the thing is if you run it through the lock and have it tied it's obvious what it is if you yeah. have to you know, go through security or whatever so what you can do is just leave the handkerchief rolled up and run through the lock, but untied. That huh. way, when you clear uh, security, you just remove it from the lock. And now it's just a padlock that yeah. you have for locking. Have something in your luggage that you actually lock, some kind of lockable yeah. box for the padlock. But then when you're walking around, run that handkerchief through the padlock and have it accessible hanging out of your pocket. So when you grab the tail ends of that handkerchief, you've got that flail on the end of it of that heavy padlock. And that's a devastating impact weapon. It's basically an yeah. uh, improvised blackjack. I, uh, when I'm wearing street clothes, uh, I've, I have a long history of competing in cowboy sports and I have a lot of trophy buckles. And I'm always thinking about that big old heavy buckle mm. that I'm wearing when I'm out wearing my jeans and boots and how it can be a formidable weapon, but even just a belt, I want to, I want to talk about that. Maybe you have some knowledge about using a belt as a weapon, just a generic, even just a dress belt. Is that such a thing? And if so, can you, can you speak to that using a belt as a weapon? So I've never done any kind of training, really focusing on that. I've seen other guys do it, like even using techniques for you know, disarming and obviously a belt you can, if you get around someone's neck can be very capable. Uh, I'd be more inclined to the heavy buckle thing with it. Uh -huh. So once again, using it as a, a, a flail, using it as sort of an improvised uh, striking weapon. But, yeah. but I have seen different techniques demonstrated. I've never messed with any of it myself, so I, I won't speak to it personally. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've, but, we've spoken to this in the past, flashlights. Flashlights, in my mind, or is that pre-planned uh, improvised weapon that we should always have out on us anyway? We can carry a flashlight. I, I'm talking about not a big D-cell mag light, but we can carry the pocket lights into the courthouse uh, through airport security. I've done it many times, and they could be an excellent weapon. And as you've mentioned many times, a distraction tool as well, right? Absolutely. The flashlight is, uh, for me personally, it's my second favorite preparedness tool after the handgun. The, right. the, the, a good flashlight is, uh, for me, it's my dedicated support hand tool. Right. Whereas uh, weaponry or dedicated weaponry available to the, the dominant hand, the support hand tool go to for me is a good flashlight. And, and what I like in a flashlight is very heavily constructed, but I like it long enough so that it protrudes at least an inch or so beyond the base of my hand when I hold it. And that gives you a very good striking tool. It gives you a significant impact weapon that if you use a light, when I travel, I use a light with no uh bezel no aggressive bezel on it a lot of the more right. tactical lights have like that cutting bezel you don't yeah. want that when you're traveling because that'll get flagged as a weapon yep. like tsa won't let it through yet right. a, a flash like that's heavily belt you don't need that bezel because what we're after we don't want to cut skin we want it in in part heavy impact and you yeah. don't need that bezel in fact i prefer not having the bezel. so okay. just a well-built light that's just an impact tool right because when you hit somebody with that 
that I don't want to draw blood. I want to impact. I want to hit with that impact, right? So yeah. I don't even like the the bezel on it. Just a regular right. flat bezel. But uh, even if it's a thin light, yeah. the, the truth is the thinner it is, the more impact it puts into that very small oh, yeah. tip. So yeah, because it, it directs be, that energy yes. down to that to that small area of the, of the object. You got it. So think of lights like the stream lights that take two AA batteries. They're like the, the width of a pencil, maybe a little bit wider. All yep. of that impact is being driven down into that small hard tip. So it gives you a really powerful striking tool. So the flashlight does all the other great things that a flashlight does. So you can find things in the dark. If you have a very powerful one, it is definitely a force multiplier in the fact that it has an intimidation factor in at night. I have shined it on people who were unconvinced were up to something nefarious and just hitting them with the beam of the light was enough to turn them off. A lot of people have had experience with that, but beyond that, it's a great striking tool. Yeah. And it can Let's talk about almost anywhere. For sure. Pens, pencils, writing utensils. Let's speak to that. I've got a I've got a I've got a highlighter in my hand. Can, can I can I use my my little highlighter? tip to defend myself maybe not but maybe i can use this got as an you got object it. right it, it's the same principle that you have with the flashlight any kind of object like that is uh it, it's imparting all of your force instead of hitting that target area let's say we go for the face or the temple the neck area on somebody yeah. instead of hitting it with oh, your meaty uh piece of your hand here which you might impart a lot of a lot of energy but it's dispersed now in something that's relatively soft and larger instead right. if you hit with an object like that all of that force is connecting in that little hard object so not only is the hit much more devastating to who you're hitting you're protecting your hand too that's yeah. one of the reasons that i if i have the option to hit somebody with bare hands or hit them with something I'd always prefer to hit them with something. It protects your own hand. I, I always have this. I have this dream, Sal, that all I have is a flashlight and I'm getting mugged in an alley or, or a pen. All I have is a pen and this guy's mugging me and I hit him so hard. I knock him out. And then I write loser across his forehead <laughs> before I leave. I, I don't so, know if that dream ever going to come to fruition, but isn't that an awesome dream? Well, now I, I would opt <laughs> usually for the flashlight, but now I wouldn't be able to write loser with the flashlight. So maybe the, maybe the pen is, is the better improvised weapon. I, uh, I hardly go anywhere without hydration, water. Sometimes I have a water bottle. Sometimes I have, sometimes I have, I have several aluminum canisters I have a battle bottle, for instance, that's uh, that's large. I'm really big into hydration. I drink a lot. Uh, water bottles can be used as a, or I'm say hydration containers of some type can be used as weapons as well. I guess they can be too big maybe sometimes. I don't know. But can you speak to that? Uh, water containers, water bottles. Yeah, for sure. So these would be used for striking. So if you get one that's sized the right way, like a 20 ounce water bottle, uh, a heavy aluminum one, you're going to hold like almost like a baseball bat, not with both hands, with one. And you can absolutely strike. And again, the principle is is when you hit a human being with an object, it protects your hands and it imparts a much harder blow, right? So there's no there's no real science to all of this. It just comes down to, we know that when you hit somebody with a hard object, you are hitting them a lot harder than anything you can do with your open hands. So the thing about the water bottle is that can go a lot of places. I, I think security in some places, like if you go to a ball game, I think sometimes they don't let the larger thermoses in but a lot of places do so if you have nothing else on you again if somebody gets really aggressive and uh in the crowd etc that you need to deal with it i'd rather have an object that i can hit with if it warrants that right we're not talking about hitting someone over the head with a, a heavy water bottle because they mouth off to you or something we're, we're talking yeah. about if you have to escalate to, to force of that level because it's much higher level force every everybody needs to remember that when we hit somebody with something it is absolutely a higher level of force and you're much more likely to do significant damage even when we come back to hitting people in the face with flashlights and pens and stuff tremendous damage compared to your open hands so you need to bear that in mind this would be tools we go to only if we need that significant level of force 
Absolutely. There are, uh, there are a lot of companies now that are manufacturing uh, weapons uh, out of materials that can't be picked up by metal detectors. One of those companies is VZ Grips. I'm looking at my uh, computer here because I actually, uh, I saw them at uh, SHOT Show a couple of years ago. No, I saw them at Blade Show a couple of years ago. And they had a tactical pencil, Sal. You may have seen this. VZ Grips, uh, VZ V is in Victor, Z is in Zebra, grips.com. They have this tactical pencil that's made out of G10. Mm. It's not a pencil, but it freaking looks like a pencil. Uh, but it's 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 a hardened material that you can use as a striking tool. They have a lot of other cool stuff. And there are other companies that make that stuff. And the tactical pens, the pens that actually write and have a sharp, uh, actually you can puncture with them, things like that. Do you think those are practical use weapons? So if it's specifically designed you know, to to be resilient against metal detection, again, it's going to be an environment where it's all you have. And if you're in a desperate situation, hands-on with somebody, I would always rather have something than nothing, right? So I think there there is a practical application. You could also go down the route of knives made out of ceramic material you know, so that you have an edged weapon on you. you you have to be aware of the laws and the the consequences for fallout with that right so yeah. the truth is if you smuggle that into an environment nobody would ever know that you have it unless something bad happens but you know, be ready for the consequences of it which very well may be only that you, you know, bypass their security policy with it so it's probably not going to be anything against state law or anything like that so fairly minor offense but you know, just bear those legal consequences in mind. I think anything that gives you, again, a force multiplier is going to be better than nothing. A tactical pen, right? I carried one of those for years. I kind of phased that out just because I always have a flashlight anyway, and I would rather have yeah. the flashlight. The flashlight can do everything the pen can do as far as using it as a striking implement with the argument that the pen is even more aggressive. You know, because even mm. though tactical pen, the idea is not so much to penetrate. If it has an aggressive tip, it's going to penetrate. There's no doubt it'll penetrate soft tissue on the body. But yeah. all of those tools is really the focus is as an impact weapon. You want to impart impact more so than, than necessarily penetrate. Yeah. I found this really cool article online uh, on the website artofmanliness.com. That's A-R-T of manliness.com. And uh, you and I talked about this briefly. Pretty, pretty neat website. Uh, it's one of those websites. If you believe in uh, toxic masculinity, you're probably not going to be checking out this website, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. Anyway, the article's called how to turn 12 everyday items into improvised weapons. I actually, I borrowed big thanks to art because I actually borrowed one of the graphics for the beginning of this video, which is really cool. But here, I want to go through these 12 items, Sal, and I want to hear your spin on whether that's practical or not practical. Mm -hmm. So, okay, number one, hot pot of coffee. <laughs> yeah, a hot pot of coffee. Absolutely can we use practical. That? Absolutely okay. practical. Okay, uh, you can cool. throw the hot coffee in somebody's eyes, and obviously it's a big glass container that you can hit with. Uh, exactly, and they've got a little graphic. The guy's doo -doo -doo, with pouring his cup of coffee. Here comes the bad guy, yep. and he throws the coffee in his face and then smashes him with the cup. And it's been done for real. More than once no in the real world. Yep. All right, cool. Uh, item number two is actually the coffee mug. So same story. It's a it's a hardened you object that already has a grip, a great impact weapon. If you have hot coffee in it, you can throw it and maybe uh, throw your attacker off. Fire extinguisher number three. We already spoke to that. We both agree that fire extinguishers can be excellent weapons and an excellent distraction weapon. If there's more than one of you or if you can distract a guy, and disarm him or disable him. Uh, awesome. Pen. Uh, item number four. We just spoke to the pen. A pen can be in the right hands, mightier than the sword, right? So to speak. Keys. That's something we haven't mentioned. Tell me about keys as weapons of opportunity, Sal. 
crypto for keys, the, the real role that's at all practical in my mind is to use it as a flail. So if you have the keys on something like one of those longer you know, key straps that is made to tuck in your waistband or something so that you can you can hit with it as a flail. I don't go for any of the teachings of having the keys coming out through your, your hand or anything like that. It's it's all kind of ridiculous. Uh, it, it does more damage to your hand than you would do damage to the bad guy. But as a flail, it could be used. Gotcha. Uh, the next one they mentioned is a locking carabiner. And you spoke to that actually as using as a sort of a brass knuckle type device. And that's exactly how they show it on the website, which I, I thought was very interesting. The next object they talk about is using a wrist watch around your around your fists around your knuckles and this is kind of an old school graphic if you go to artofmanliness.com and research that article you'll see this graphic of this guy he looks like he's dressed like 1960s uh, suit like oh, every guy came mm -hmm. home from waiting for dinner from his wife from work wearing a suit carrying a briefcase and with the metal watch uh, i've got you know, my my g-shock here which is pretty substantial i suppose if i wrapped it or if i had the wherewithal and the time which mm. doesn't seem real practical to wrap it around my wrist yeah maybe i could use it as a weapon but i'm gonna call it not practical yeah what you say? Not pro well so you would need time so if you saw a situation you were going into and that's all you had i suppose and i can think of i own one watch i don't wear it very much but it's a diving watch and yeah. it is heavy and it has an enormous stainless steel basil and a very solid stainless steel uh, strap that that would be heavy enough to act like the carbine or actual brass knuckles. So I would yeah. say if you're going to actually plan on using that in that capacity, if you have to, then then wear the white the right watch for it. The next uh, object they talk about is an aluminum water bottle. We actually talked about that as well, using that water bottle as an impact weapon. Uh, their graphic actually shows the guy running his belt through the class with the bottle swinging it oh, around his head okay. so Making that he it. can strike the guy with it it seems like it would work but you have to have the time to put it all together and wouldn't you have to have practiced that a little yeah, bit i was just gonna say using have some any training? kind of flail device is hazardous because if you don't connect it comes back to you right when yeah. a flail object like that a shorter thing like the handkerchief through the padlock is much more controllable. So if I was going to do a flail kind of device, that's the way I would go with it. Well, that reminds me back of my Wild West entertainment days when I was using a, a several different types of bull whips. And before I actually got trained, and I whipped the crap out of myself with that thing sure. before I actually could use it. And I got good enough I could use it as a target whip. Who's going to walk down the street with a bull whip though and actually have the training to it use look one? Cool, the, it would look cool though. Yeah. You need your Indiana Jones hat to go with it. I I am going to do a short video with my bull whips and post it to uh, survival dispatch just for fun. I'm going to do that. Note to self, a belt. That's the next object they talk about uh, using a belt as a weapon, either as a flailing weapon, as a choking weapon or something like that. Again, I, I don't know. I don't know how practical that is. It takes training, takes time, takes preparation. I, I know you agree with me. Moving on, hornet spray, wasp spray. Tell me about that as a weapon. So if it's all you have, absolutely. So again, that would be a weapon of opportunity or an improvised weapon. Now, here's one thing I will say. You don't want to carry or use hornet spray instead of OC spray intentionally. Because Agreed. that is that is uh that can do serious damage to people's eyes, etc. So yeah, if we use something as a less lethal tool, you need to use the dedicated less lethal tool. So yeah. an absolute no to hornet spray for for using instead of OC spray. However, let's say it's all you have against a deadly threat, then absolutely yeah. if somebody's armed yeah. with a gun, you have a chance to spray them in the face with hornet spray to give you an advantage to rush them. Yeah. Absolutely, it's another weapon of opportunity. Uh, and uh, with these, I've, I've used them. Many of us have used this, especially those of us who have, have owned our own properties, uh, especially rural, rural properties, uh, wasp spray, hornet spray. And one of the main advantages of it is the distance. Ooh. You can literally spray 20 feet away with this stuff and stay away from the threat, which would be the insects that you're trying to get rid of. But the, the, real, the fact of the matter is 
There's a lot of good aerosol self-defense sprays out there that can create a lot of distance. Even that little uh, less than two ounce canister that uh, I keep with me, uh, I think I can get 15 feet, give or take. And it's a gel, so it doesn't fog. It sprays out in the form of a stream of gel, which I think is is very effective. Now, I do have the bear spray also, but who walks down the street right. with a can of bear spray? Uh, and you certainly couldn't take it to the courthouse or through the airport, TSA would, would get you pretty quick on that. Uh, they talk about a flashlight. We've already spoken to that. A smartphone. How can you use a smartphone as a weapon, Sal? Well, a phone is very important as your communication device, but the thing that springs to mind immediately is holding a phone like this so that once again, yeah. we're hitting with an object, especially if it's in a solid case, like one of the otter boxes or something, you've yep. got, a, again, think of it like a karate chop on steroids, because now if I hit somebody with the edge of that, I'm imparting a lot more impact. So just like any other uh, impact tool that you would pick up, it's going to be better than hitting with your open hand. Uh, it's probably one of the most opportune weapons of improvised weapons or weapons of opportunity, because just about everybody's carrying one in their hand these days, right. uh, whether you should or not. Situational awareness, guys. We can't speak enough to that. But we, we, if we're not, if it's not in your hands, probably in your pocket, right, or mm -hmm. on your belt, or really mm -hmm. close by. So those are the objects that uh, artofmanliness.com speaks to. I think that's uh, it, it's it's a very interesting conversation. A lot of stuff. So if you could summarize this conversation, Sal, what are some of the big takeaways of weapons of opportunity that our viewers should think about? Think about what's in your environment. So it's going to factor in mostly when you're unarmed, obviously, right? So if you are forced to be unarmed in any given environment, which unfortunately there's many places we have to go where we can't be armed, what's around you that you can use as an advantage. And it's going to be those tools that you can use predominantly as impact weapons that give you a tremendous advantage. If, if you have to attack back, right, when you have a violent, deadly threat, that's what we're talking about here. And again, just to remind people, we're not talking about picking up a chair and hitting some guy over the head because he's in a heated argument with you, right? We're talking about dealing with a violent, deadly threat when you are unarmed. That's what these weapons of opportunity would be for. All right. Hey, we're about out of time. What it's time for now, Sal, we got to answer the conflicted question of the day would you would you read that back to us one more time all right so let's read it again and again this one is uh this is going to be a tough one as well so here's the question one more time a deadly flu outbreak has infected one third of your group and you don't have the means to quarantine them or the medicine to help them do you vote with the rest of your group to banish them from your group or do you take it upon yourself to eliminate the infected ones before it spreads any further oh man talk about conflicted so for our viewers again Again, these are this is the apocalypse post-apocalypse scenario right. we're in our we have our own little survival group man i guess i gotta answer this first this time <laughs> yeah, so i i do? can only so i can only vote to banish them or or eliminate them which basically means yes so so i'm not that i, I just they're part of my core group if those are the only two, if those are the only two uh, options I have, gosh, I, I I guess I would I would banish them from the group because I don't want to off them. I'm not they're they're not they're they're part of my my core group. If those are the only two options I have. I don't want to kill them. I, I said, I guess I would have to say, what's your answer? So if this is part of your group, I presume these are allies to you and people you generally yeah. like. Are these people I, I hate already? So maybe that would change my opinion of what to do here. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking not since this is now the scenario is it's part of your group. So to me, it seems pretty extreme uh, taking it upon yourself to eliminate them before, before it spreads. So just so going down the rabbit hole with this a little bit. <clears throat> <clears throat> if we're talking about something that's very infectious and very deadly, if you kill that person, which I think is absurd anyway, if that if this is part of your group, but what do you do with the body? This hardly stops oh. the spread of that infection, right? And now we have blood and other pathogens laying around. So to me, it, it doesn't seem like a good call. I suppose if you killed them and maybe burnt the bodies, if it's extremely infectious, maybe that's kind of the thinking here, the safer thing to do. But I would have to say, 
say the same, Denny. I would say let's give them the provisions they deserve and just uh, we're going to force them to separate from from the rest of the group. Well, that, that's there's no easy answers no, to, to these questions. We're going to continue doing these conflicted questions during our episodes. So I'm just going to ask our viewers, what would you do? in that circumstance with that conflicted uh, question. And let's speak to the conversation. Please tell us in the comments about your ideas of improvised weapons. And if you've ever had that opportunity yourself that you had to go to an improvised weapon or a weapon of opportunity, and maybe you think of some cool stuff we haven't talked about today, let us know in the comments. Sal, as always, you've been a fantastic contributor uh, to the conversation today. We're going to wrap things up. Remind everybody to hit all those buttons, like, subscribe, comment, and share. Stay safe, safe out there, everybody, and we'll see you next time.